How's it going everybody? Rob right here today and we are back with our Honolulu Hammerheads franchise mode here in season number three and today guys things are a bit different. I have no controller in my hands. When I went to record this um, I, my mic just didn't work so you'll have to bear with me and get the post editing commentary um, but before we jump in guys I, I hope you're liking the series. I have updated everything down in the in the link tracker so in the top comment in the pinned comment should be a tracker uh to track everything that's happened in this honolulu hammerheads franchise mode if you are new and just stumbled upon this episode um so you can catch up and see what's happened and where we've come from but today guys we are going to keep safranov and benson on the top line just for the first month or so to really see how they end up doing alongside of matthews right can they both float uh are they both gonna sink maybe one or the other is gonna be successful now on his wing so the plus five is too good to to resist so they're gonna stay on his wing for about a month we'll see how they end up doing um our goaltenders are still gonna stay the same um and the lines are really just uh, guys this looks like it's going to be a fantastic season the sorelli veneers kuzmenko line is such a solid second line and in years past that was our first line but now now that we have safranov matthews and benson i mean guys we are ready to just just take off i think as a franchise this is going to be our breakout season uh, but I wanted to update you guys on the coaching. Um, one of the things I did was hire Bruce Allen just because he's got A-plus coach influence. And hopefully he can t teach Joe Thornton. Yes, Jumbo Joe is one of our coaches. Obviously, his D offense is not great. Ulrich doesn't look great, but he is the goalie coach, so I doubt he's going to impact anything too much. But Allen, Thornton, and Savard are going to be directly responsible for how we play. And Strombolopoulos, I am totally fine with him as our head coach. I mean... He led last year's team. I mean, our AHL team didn't fluctuate much year over year. And then in year two, when he took over, he took them to the Calder Finals and they became a dominant team. So hopefully Strombolopoulos, as our AHL head coach, will be great. He's got that A coach influence too, so he's going to grow those guys down there. So maybe we want to start promoting from within. Maybe if Joe Thornton isn't cutting it or not growing, right, that D offense is really going to hurt, but... Um, take a look at our scouts, guys. As you can see, I did a lot of revamping, and the A's and the B's and the A minuses, right? They're all over the place. Um, and I know I normally make maybe one trade at the beginning of every season. Right now, it's looking like we don't have much surplus as far as guys I'd need to get rid of because I want to contend, right? But it seems like the one area that we have some surplus here is goaltending, right? We've got the, uh, uh, I think it's Landon Van Riemsdyk. It might be Louis Van Riemsdyk. I'm not sure, but he's medium elite, and he's going to come up eventually. And right now, the odd man out is Rodrigue. Based on the age and the overall and the potential, it seems like Rodrigue is the odd man out. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump here. You guys will see a lot more cuts than you're used to seeing because I'm not actively playing and talking. Um, this is the post-edit, obviously. So we're just going to scratch him and play uh, Tristan Lennox, who's only 21, but a 74 medium starter. And now that the scouting is done, we can jump ahead to start the season. We are going to get into some gameplay in this episode, and I'm going to do the gameplay sort of like I do uh, my Hut Road to Glory gameplay, right? So I'll show you guys uh, the goals and the important stuff that happened, uh, but you guys won't have to sit through an entire period. Now, it's only three-minute periods, but... We don't want to play a game on the road. We definitely want to play on home ice, get all that customization, just soak it in. All that time I spent trying to make the Honolulu Hammerheads look so fantastic. Uh, I can't take full credit for the branding of this team. It was, uh, if you guys don't know the story, it was a team that started in 2000, uh, NHL 19, 2019. Um, and my college roommates and I, we, we created this team and it just became just Matt. We played it like every day, multiple games a day. We got, we played every game got through multiple seasons uh but we got the season underway with a one and one start and now we're going to jump into this game against the minnesota wild who are zero and two to start the season not like that means too much um but we'll jump into the sim here we are going to sim the first and it's 2-2 with safranov that might be his first career goal i don't know if he scored one in the first two games but in period two they take the lead 4-2 and it's a perfect opportunity for us to jump in you guys can see matthews there and of course we gotta rock the alternates in the first game that we're gonna play i absolutely love the alternates they've got that um outline look for both the logo and the numbers i think they look super cool but you guys can see our x factors are all are all over the place with benson and safranov they look fantastic, and I cannot wait to see their career progress. You got Benson number nine on right wing. You got Safranov number 64 on the left wing. And number nine, Benson is going to skate into the zone. He's got some speed, but he gets wrecked. So does Matthews, but Safranov picks it up. Shakes off one check, cuts to the front of the net. 
And guys, I'm going to be 100% honest, I didn't even shoot that one. That one, I just got pushed in and it went five hole on Wallstead, who's I think that like the, I did the player search. If you guys look in the link in the description, or not uh, the link in the comment, the Google sheet, you guys can see the top players per uh, per season, right? What their overalls are, who they play for, and who they are. Um, and he's actually the sixth best goaltender this season. Um, but we were able to sneak that one five hole. But Sorelli fights off his man. Veneers finds a great position and scores that one low far side. That's like a realistic goal, honestly. The battle in the corner, popping the puck out to just in that low part of the circle in the slot. And then the firing... Uh, in far side from Veneers. This probably felt like the most realistic goal I've scored in a while on Chell. And of course, it comes in franchise mode. And that's what you'll have to see, a realistic goal in franchise mode. But we've already tied the game up just five minutes into the third period here. And we jump ahead to less than a minute left. The Minnesota Wild are on the attack. Kaprizov finds steal. A great defensive poke there by Gerard Kaprizov. Shot blocked by Safranov. That's a huge so shot blocked by our young sniper, Gerard kicks it out to Bean, who finds Benson. Benson, like I said, does have some wheels. He turns his man, he gets to the byline, and crosses it to Bean, who redirects it with 31.9 left to get us a 5-4 lead. And ultimately, guys, this will be a 5-4 victory. Obviously, I'm accepting the coach's decision to lock it down on defense. We got our first line out there against the Erickson Eck line. Erickson Eck always scores. As you can see, here comes Matthews. Are we going to get another one? And I couldn't get Wallstedt to move off his line, but he passed that one out, and somehow I don't end up getting that one. But a good check there from Addison. Pedersen does find Matthews. We're just going to try and keep this thing low. Benson wasn't ready for it. Goes off his skate. We're going to poke that thing one too many times. It goes out, and I accidentally switched to Pedersen, and they bring a three-on-two. Beckman, the save there by Ananen. Puck is loose, and yes, it is our backup Ananen, not the starter Lukanen, because we are on the second of a back-to-back. -back. We lost to Seattle in the last one. They are going to pull their goalie, but with only 4.8 left, all we have to do is win the faceoff, and we'll get out of this one. Uh, with a win in our first gameplay. We're going to lose the face off those Spurgeon shoots. It gets through a good save. Gerard, we're going to get that thing out. And that is the buzzer. A 5-4 come from behind victory in our first game played as the Hammerheads. Now, um, speaking of gameplay, I do like showing you guys the gameplay. And I, I want to know what your thoughts are when we do eventually make the playoffs. I know at some point we're going to make the playoffs. What do you want me to do about that? Do you guys want me to keep the playoffs in this kind of episode? Like a season three it also includes the playoffs at the end? Or do you want to do a, a season three playoffs as its own video, right? And we can it, it could be really short, but it could be really quick or really long because we make a deep cup run or something. You guys let me know what you want to see there. Uh, I, I, I'm, I can go either way. I was thinking about adding it in, but these videos do end up being an hour long, 40 to 45 minutes to an hour uh, just to get one season in. And I know you guys want to... Uh, I want to get these things in as quickly as possible. Some of you don't have an, a full hour to sit down and watch the whole thing in one sitting. Um, so maybe you guys want to see the playoffs, even if it may be a 15-minute playoff run or it maybe is a 45-minute playoff run. Uh, maybe we do that in a separate video. But And also, in the playoffs, maybe I'll just play one game. I think, I, I think I've allowed myself in the past to jump into one game per series, depending on what the series record is. I kind of make that decision on the fly. If we're down 3-1, I'll jump in. Maybe if it looks like we're going to get eliminated... Or, uh, you know, if it's 3-3 and we go to a game seven, maybe I'll jump into game seven um, there. But so far this season, we've looked about as good as I'd expect. Better than in seasons past, but we're not yet a dominant team. Uh, we seem to be a bit of, uh, of streaky here and there. We string a few together. We get a few points in a row. Then we lose a couple in a row. And our amateur scout is saying that this is a weaker draft class. And going through this season, guys... I don't agree with that, that that the assessment that this is a weaker draft class. This is the draft class with Michael uh, Misa, Misa. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce his name, uh, but he's ranked fourth, and I know he's really good. Um, so the fact that he's ranked fourth is crazy. Uh, but taking a look here at, at the start of the season, it just looks like uh, Benson, Safranov, and Matthews, they just aren't going to work as a line. What my fear was before the season is that they were going to get shelled. They may put up points, but they were just going to get bombed. Um, so you can see they're all a big minus. Minus five, minus four, and minus four. The one guy not putting up points, though, is Safranov. And I think I'm going to keep him on the third line. And then we just have to kind of decide who goes where, right? Right now, we got Benson, Matthews, Yamamoto. 
Yamamoto's been fine, but Kuzmenko is a point per game. So I'm going to give him the opportunity um, on the first line with Matthew, Matthews and Benson to see if he can keep that up. We'll play Sorelli, Beniers, and Yamamoto. It's so nice to have, like, Yamamoto because he's that extra guy, right? Benson on the top line, I think he's going to be okay for now. Safranov, you guys can see, he's he's solid enough as a goal scorer, but it's the defensive side of things that just isn't quite as good. Uh, we took care of the scouting there, too. No other line changes to speak of. The power play is going to stay the same just because I want to keep getting Safranov and... Uh, and Matthews and Benson, they get a plus five on the power play, but uh, everything's going well enough. I think we could be a little bit better. We have Matthews. We've got a really deep forward core. Our defense is solid, uh, led by Samuel Girard, um, but you guys can see we have 27 points in 24 games played. We're pretty darn close to the Ducks and Oilers, but we're also pretty darn close to the Kraken and the Sharks down at the bottom. Uh, the Kings continue to be bottom feeders. Pretty much this entire uh, franchise mode so far, the Kings have been one of the worst teams. So we'll go up another month here, uh, December so far, making that first line change where we drop Safranov and put Kuzmenko. We immediately get three wins. I keep getting a lot of offers for Dickinson, but I really like him as the 13th forward, so we're going to keep him there. Four straight wins now with Kuzmenko on the top line and moving Safranov down. And when, of course, we lose to the bottom, feeding uh, Kings, but we bounce right back with two more wins, three wins. I mean, guys, look at that stretch. Uh, we went uh, seven and one in that eight game stretch since we moved Kuzmenko up. You guys can see we are starting to put in more goals. We're starting to look a little bit better here. Uh, a win and a loss to end it there, but we have now climbed into second place and Andre Kuzmenko stays as a point per game player now here at January 1st, about halfway through the season. He's on pace for 80. If you would have told me I would have gotten 80 points on Andre Kuzmenko back when I signed him before last season, I would have said you're joking yourself because there's no way he's going to be more than a 60, maybe 70 point getter. Um, but he's currently on pace for 82 and 82. Uh, you guys can see that Matthews has gotten a plus again. Benson's a plus, but holy smokes. Sorelli, Beniers, Kuzmenko, that line is dominant. Safranov is improving slightly. I believe only at nine points. And then, then in this month, he got another nine. So um, he seems to have found his footing there on the third line. So we're going to leave him there. We're not going to move him up just because things are, you know, turning around, right? Obviously, we want to keep the first line the way it is. And go up another month here in January. Hopefully we can stay in a in a uh, divisional spot and not drop to a wild card spot. Uh, I believe this long break here is the All Star break. Uh, I don't see it in February, so it's probably on the 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 twenty fifth there. And I was saying this in the uh, when I was live simming, right? Because I didn't know my mic wasn't working when I originally recorded this. Um, I kind of wish EA would give us like uh, the playable all-star game at least. It's 3v3. All you have to do is maybe use points or just pick the number one player in points from each team. I mean, and then use points or something. I, I don't know. Use overall after that. But I think it would be kind of cool if they could get the all-star game back in there. As well as how cool would it be to have the all-star skills competition. Um, you know, to have the fastest skater, the accuracy shooting, the... The hardest shot, I think those would be super cool. Maybe one for goalies as well. The breakaway challenge, right? Maybe if you're a skater uh, for your division, and then you can also play goalie for your division. I don't know. I think it'd be pretty cool to have those couple events. I know 2K has the dunk contest. I know they've got the uh, the three-point contest as well. I'm not sure what else they have, but like, do, do the big ones, right? Don't do the... Uh, the pitch and puck or or tendy tandem right you know those might be harder to code in but uh, you can easily do accuracy shooting heck we used to have it back in the 360 ps3 era nhl 14 right it was the tutorial just bring the tutorial back put slap a fresh coat of all-star design on it and boom that's you're done <laughs> and then we would go crazy in the franchise community because we'd have it back it'd be such a cool addition i really don't see why you can't just copy paste i mean obviously the the, the engine's different right but you did it in the past right you did the accuracy shooting hardest shot could be kind of cool it's been there you've done it can we please bring it back to have a little bit more immersion into the uh into the franchise mode right i feel like that's one of the things that the coaches definitely help um, with immersion, uh, you know, having Jumbo Joe retire and become a coach or a scout, right? Um, but here you guys can see I am changing the lines enough about my ideas for franchise mode. Um, we're going to move Patterson up just to kind of help out the defense. The second line seems to be elite uh, anyway. And I kind of want to uh, to make a change here because things, uh, they're okay, but they're, they're still not fantastic. The second line has kind of dropped in their plus minus. Kuzmenko continues to be great, but he's no longer getting the points as he was. You guys can see that uh, Bean uh, is just a big old minus. Same thing with, with Gerard. 
Um, uh, fine on the third line, right? Zak is doing well. Uh, Victor Olofsson's got 29 and 51. I am not giving him enough credit. The fourth line is just playing like the fourth line would. Eight, eight and a half, nine minutes a night. They're not really going to do anything um, too significant for the franchise. I know Marchman's contract is now starting to look bad now that he's on the fourth line, but, you know, I I'll take it. Considering we aren't really cash-strapped, and he's somebody that, you know, with one more year left, maybe we could move hit on from him. Um, change of scenery for him. Goaltenders are looking fine as well, so we're good to go there. Up here at February 1st, uh, well, let's get, go ahead and get up to the trade deadline where I think we're probably going to want to acquire uh, another defensive defenseman. I moved Pedersen up simply because we needed somebody like that. Um, to help out Girard. Obviously, the two offensive defensemen with the young Benson up top and then Kuzmenko. I mean, we didn't have much defensive thought on the first line. The second line, yes, with Sorelli and Beniers, they're defensive gods. They're two-way machines. Um, but as far as, you know, maybe moving on from something in the future, we're not probably not going to move on from Kivi Haru. Uh, Jake Bean, he's got four years left at six and a half million. I think that's fine for him as an 85 offensive defenseman. He's going to be a rock on that second pairing, probably. Uh, we'll find a guy to play with him, right? Like maybe Pedersen could if we acquire a top line defensive defenseman. Um, but maybe Brustevich is the guy that we end up moving on from, I, right? I, I know we got Kivi Haru to kind of replace him, right? Um, as the future defenseman of the franchise. Samuel Girard, probably when he's on his way out, Kivi Haru will be on his way in. Um, and those two will probably play with each other for maybe a year or two. Um, and then we'll hand the keys of the defense over to Kibiharu. We obviously do need to improve our defensive pipeline just a bit. Uh, we've got a couple players that look good. Um, but look at that. Three straight wins now. Make it four in a row. We lose to Vancouver, who's at the top of our division. We lose to Edmonton, which is not good. But we bounce right back. Um, so this Pedersen on the top line change looks like it's working pretty well. Two losses since we did it. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many, uh, yeah, four wins, five wins, six wins, seven wins, a shootout loss, an overtime loss. So we only lost four times in regulation since we put Pedersen on the top line, but I still feel like we can improve. We seem to be that next best team, right? We're behind the Flames and Canucks by a decent margin, but we're ahead of the rest of the pack. And looking at the wild card, we seem to be relatively okay as long as we keep on this pace, right? So I'm, I'm pretty confident that we are going to make the playoffs for the first time in Hammerhead's history. And you guys can see, obviously, Beniers, Kuzmenko, oh my god, they're plus 30 and 29. Uh, Girard's plus minus is improving. His points are doing well. Safranov is starting to put up a bit more points. Plus minus is, a, is, is pretty middling, right? It hasn't gotten better, hasn't gotten worse. But Pedersen, with 20 minutes a night, being a plus 32, even putting up 21 points. I think I, I think he was definitely a smart decision to put him on the top line. But Beniers, Kuzmenko... I mean, he looks, Beniers looks like he's going to be a phenomenal second line center for the rest of his career here in Honolulu. Kuzmenko on his wing and Sorelli on his wing. Um, I mean, those three guys were our second line to start the season. And you guys can see they are clicking. We have easily found something with Beniers, Kuzmenko, Sorelli. Um, so we might be, we might want to find a nickname for that line to, uh, to give it a, a fun nickname. Um, I can't think of one right now. Uh, but I'm sure you guys in the comments, you guys are always smarter than I am. So, um, you guys can see though, Patterson moving him up to the top line was a smart decision. The third pairing is not playing a ton compared to the other guys. Um, but they're doing their job, right? 10 points, positive plus minus, uh, Patterson and Addison seem to both be great. Um, Bean, uh, it's tough, right? I like Bean a lot. I think he's a great offensive defenseman, but I don't think pairing him with, Samuel Girard would be a very smart move anymore. I mean, we saw Girard was a minus last year, even though he put up, I think, 60-some points. Um, and then, obviously, goaltending. I can't complain about it. Obviously, I'd like to see a little bit better, but, you know, Lukanen is doing fine. Um, and we are gonna, ready to jump into the trade deadline in just a second. Hold on. Wait, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We're going to take a look at players that are expiring that we may want to move on from or bring back. And Pedersen is one of those expiring guys. And... Knizov as well. He's been okay. He only fits the third pairing as a medium top four. I think we could probably move on from him. Paterka's been a solid bottom line player. He wants the Jason Dickinson contract, so I'll give it to him. 1.4 over two years. He might be, end up being the 13th forward. Dylan Coughlin, he's been good. He only wants 1.75. I mean, he's been a perfect uh, third pairing defenseman. You guys can see last season was a minus five, but this season he's playing much, much better. A uh, little bit more ice time. Good way to takeaway ratio is not bad, not great, but his hits and blocks are are definitely welcomed. 
Knizov, you guys can see he's very similar to Coglin. They're both basically the same player. Um, Coglin's got the benefit of being a two-way defenseman, and Knizov, I think, has more value than Coglin. Um, so Knizov at 2.275. I don't even want to know what he wants to come back. Josh Brook could end up being the another defenseman to keep an eye out for. Remember, we still have Norlander. Unfortunately, Brook doesn't look like he wants a lot of money. So um, I think that's going to kind of spell that he's going to be a career AHLer. But Tristan Lennox, a three-year deal for the 22-year-old. He'll be 25 by the time that deal ends. We'll see where he gets to. He could end up being our backup of the future. Uh, but Marcus Pedersen, he's just been too dang good, guys, for me to not want to bring him back. It is a little bit of a more expensive deal, but honestly, less than $5 million. I can get him on a little bit uh, fewer years. He doesn't take penalties as a defensive defenseman. That's huge. He only fits the bottom two pairings, but really, I'm not going to plan on playing him on the top pairing once we have the ability to make some moves here. I think a three-year deal, though, at 4.8 is kind of perfect, 4.75, because I'm a little bit stingy. Um, we'll see if he <laughs> takes it. Um, and those are the contract extensions which we are going to offer I think that Pedersen deal is going to be a good one if he ends up accepting it. Uh, as a middle pairing guy to play with Bean, that's like $10 million for our middle defensive pairing. They're both really high quality if we can go get somebody at the trade deadline here. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at where we are in the standings. It's just a reminder for everybody. We are looking pretty good. Let's take a look at this team stats, honestly, too, um, because we have... Honestly, a really good team. Like, if you look at our goals for and goals against, the 317 and the 2878, excuse me. Uh, 278 is seems to be <laughs> bad according to our division. But if you look at where we are in the entire league, 2.78 is like 10th right now in the league. It just so happens that our division are a bunch of defensive stalwarts. The Ducks, Kraken, Canucks, Flames are all above us in the entire league. And they all happen to play in our division. And as far as goals for per game, I think we're in ninth. That's 8th or ninth place. So, a top 10 team when it comes to goals for and goals against. We're not quite top 10 in points percentage. We're slightly outside of that, but we are the 10th most points in the league. Um, our power play percentage, and this is something that I've noticed um, as I've dug into the weeds a bit more, right? Our power play percentage is 17.2%, but I kind of expected it to be bad even with the plus 5 in Austin Matthews. And our penalty kill percentage is elite. So, this is something I wanted to uh, articulate and illustrate for you guys. Your coaches matter, right? Getting the plus five on the power play is great and all, but look at our power play. It's B, B, C, and then our goalie coach is a B minus. I'm not really going to factor him much, but B, B, C compared to our uh, PK of B, B, A, um, you can see that's why our penalty kill is so much better than our power play, right? That's uh, the A for Joe Thornton versus the C for Joe Thornton. Right, so our, our coaching staff is not the best as far as power play is concerned. I'm hoping they can grow. Maybe we replace Joe Thornton or uh, Bruce Allen. I mean, Gaspard Savard looks like he's close to growing. As you guys can see, um, coaches do grow. And I think making a playoff run here, so a playoff push, I think would be very, very good for our coaches. It'd be great for their experience. I think making the playoffs might help them uh, grow a bit more too. So I accidentally spammed the A button um, and say we're a seller. <laughs> um, so we are going to enter the trade deadline, though. Some really interesting names here at the front of the of the uh, trade block. I wanted to see what it would take to reunite Mitch Marner with Austin Matthews. Obviously, it's not a deal that really makes much sense. But the Jacob Chikrin does make sense, right? 89, medium elite, on an expiring deal. So we offer him what we want to offer him. Uh, they wanted next year's first, uh, this year's second, and Olafson, Sorelli, Beniers, Kibiharu, Berkeley Catton. It's really, <laughs> there's really not much of a starting point here um, with them. I'm going to take a look at how Chikrin fits. I mean, he looks elite. Like, look, he's just insane. But unfortunately, he only fits the third defensive pairing. Um, his, his underlying attributes are crazy good, though. Like, um, he's been okay on Arizona. His giveaway to takeaway ratio is not good, but he hits a ton and blocks a ton of shots. The penalty minutes aren't really that high either. And you guys can see they probably want to move on from Chikrin because I mentioned this in the offseason video. But all this elite talent, they somehow got Gunther back on a one-year $0.86 million deal. I don't know how he accepted that. He's an 82 medium lead at 21. I don't know why he's taking a .86 for one year, but <laughs> uh, why not? But you guys could see that Arizona is going to be a problem in the future. They've got so much talent. Um, here we are looking for some defenders. 
Uh, Kuzmenko is unfortunately on the block. I hate that because it's not... I, he's been our best player, I'd say. Uh, most consistent, anyway. I know he's no longer a point-per-game player, but he's still an elite player for us. He's part of that uh, sorelli Beniers kuzmenko line. Essa Lindell is an interesting one, and I would definitely call them... And, and there was that trade number two. Looks really, really interesting. Trade number two is Bonk, a third, and Dickinson. And I think... That's definitely a starting place. It depends on what Esselindel looks like. He is, again, another expiring deal, so we don't have to worry too much about it. But Esselindel is a two-way defender. Looks pretty solid, really good defensively. He does fit all defensive pairings. Um, but we don't want to just jump on, on the first thing. And Bonk here, obviously... Oh, it's not, it's not, he's not the greatest. Low top four, we'll see. Jason Dickinson, I like keeping him as the 13th forward, but if we can get an Essa Lindell, that would be fantastic. But I think I'm going to keep looking to see what other players are out there simply because I want a defensive defenseman. We'll also look at all of the defensemen out there. I think Truba, uh, the trade price is a bit rich of a second and a third in Dickinson. That's doable. So we'll take a look at Truba here in just a second. We'll hit edit trade and take a look. Just does Truba fit? Duh, his contract of eight million for two years though is quite a bit at 31. He looks okay, but he only fits the third defensive pairing, which I found has been a problem quite a bit. Is that we're finding a lot of defensemen that only fit the third pairing and not our top four. Um, so it seems like if we get somebody that fits the top four, we want to hold on to them. Somebody like Jake Bean, right? He fits the top four, and uh. I want to keep a hold of him. Same thing with Pedersen, although Pedersen really does fit the third defensive pairing better than he fits the second defensive pairing. Uh, but he's still a fantastic player. He, he's been so good this season. I'm just going to see what teams would offer me for him to see if maybe extending him was the right idea. Uh, they want to give me some thirds, some average level players, some middle sixers, and then some prospects. A second here from Seattle is pretty interesting. Uh, give us back our second, uh, funny enough. Uh, but really, Pedersen, I think, is too valuable at 83 overall. And plus, I think get, get him at five, or 475 for three more years. I think that's going to be perfect. We can look to trade him maybe at the end of that when we start to get some defensemen that are growing in the pipeline. Get those guys ready to come up. Um, Olimata and Jared Spurgeon, not really guys that I'm interested in. And at this point, we're not really finding any upgrade players right they're all 82s they're not guys that i want to put next to gerard if i'm gonna get an 82 i might as well put uh Pedersen, just leave Pedersen there we're gonna start looking through the teams though at defensemen um and you guys can see really the ducks not anybody that i want i want chikrin shen would be interesting he's an 81 and he's got two years at five million fits the top four but again I might as well keep Pedersen. And then I, my eyes lock on Brandon Carlo here, guys. He looks like a fantastic defensive defenseman. He's got some offensive upside with that 85 passing. Um, he's been okay for them. Boston seems to have, have some struggles with him. Uh, he's getting 19 minutes, so he's on their second pairing. His giveaway to takeaway ratio is not great. Um, but he's got three years at 4.1 left as an 85. He's basically on the... Um, Marcus Patterson trajectory. You can see his 80 offensive awareness. I'd like to see that a little bit higher, but he's very physical. He's not an awful skater. An elite defensive category. Good puck skills. Um, and, and offensive awareness that I would hope to, to grow a bit. Uh, and here I'm just curious why power is worse than uh, lower value than Darlene. But then I rem remembered they upgraded Darlene to have X-Factors. And he's a medium franchise, so... Um, I, I started this, unfortunately, like the week before they gave them zone abilities. Um, but another right-handed guy that's really interesting here is Mackenzie Weger. Now, I know he's a two-way defender, but he's got those X-Factors. Seven years at 4725 is a lot for 31 years old, right? We'd have him until he's 48. I also wanted to say I hope Rasmus Anderson is okay um, after what just happened to him in real life. I haven't seen any other news but other than the fact that um, he got hit, by, I think, by a car while he was on a scooter. I think that's what happened. Um, hopefully, he's okay, though. Um, looking at Brett Pesci here, another guy that's kind of interesting to me, a defensive defenseman, only fits the third defensive pairing, though, as we're seeing a lot. These guys are really only fitting the third defensive pairing. Uh, obviously, I'm not getting anybody from the Colorado Avalanche. Bowen Byram, interesting, uh, fits defensive pairing too, but if I'm going to get a medium elite 23-year-old, he has to fit more than just a second pairing. Um, Bokvist is interesting. Jurasek is also interesting, but he only fits the third pairing. I really don't think I'm going to get either of those guys, even if I wanted to. The Dallas Stars don't really have anybody. 
uh, that would be interesting. Philip Hironik is the next guy that catches my eye here. Five and a half million over six years. A two-way defenseman, though, that seems to be, I mean, honestly, really, really well-rounded. A good offensive awareness, good passing, good defensive awareness. The defensive category, I don't know why it's rated so lowly. Um, you guys can see his giveaway to takeaway ratio is some of the best. His hits and blocks are really, really high, which is you like to see that. His penalty minutes aren't that high either. He does put up 20-ish points, and they play him 21 minutes a night, so... It's definitely a player I'd be interested in going after, um, as well as Brandon Carlo or Uyghur. Uh, You guys can see here Bouchard is an offensive defenseman. I don't need any more of those. Good Lord, we have plenty of offensive defensemen. Not getting Aaron Ekblad, that's for sure. Uh, Drew Doughty, if it was less years left, I might consider it. Brant Clark is offensive. Uh, Minnesota, we already looked at Barry, Truba, Spurgeon. Essa Lindell is now on the uh, Montreal Canadiens. So while I was doing my due diligence, Montreal did not hesitate to take the opportunity and snatch him out from under us. So Essa Lindell is no longer an option for us, but that's okay. I think I like the idea of Brandon Carlo, the right shot defensive defenseman. I think the most out of anybody here. John Marino is a really interesting guy. Same thing with Matt Dumba, but they don't really fit. And then here's the guys that they just drafted. The first overall pick from 2022 in Kostitsin. Um, he's on his ELC now at 83. Two-way defender does fit our top four. Would be really cool to get him. Um, and then... Simon Nemec here as well, another early round pick. And Vancouver offers, offers us a trade for Coglin, which I don't want because I don't want to give up Coglin. I'm a conservative buyer and not a seller. I accidentally uh, called ourselves a seller. But jumping to the next team in the list here, let's take a look at the New York Islanders. We've got plenty of defensemen. Pollock, uh, he's pretty good. He fits all defensive pairings, but six years at 6.15 for a 30-year-old. Probably not going to do it for me uh, compared to what else is on the table. Ryan Lindgren here is kind of interesting as a defensive defenseman. Looks really good. Uh, Keandre Miller, but they're both left shots. I'm kind of looking for a right shot defensive defenseman. Maybe I'm kind of locking myself in. Uh, the Flyers apparently want to get rid of all their defensemen, but I don't want any of their defensemen. Uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins, Jan Rudda fits all defensive pairings. Could be kind of interesting. Um, uh, we could bring Graves back. We know he fits. We know he likes the team. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think we're going to bring him back. I don't think uh, it, it's worth another left shot. Colton Pareko, unfortunately, doesn't fit the scheme. Uh, Chernak would be great if it wasn't seven years at 5.2. And the fact that he only fits the third pairing. Nobody there uh, from Toronto. Vancouver doesn't really have many other defensemen. Uh, Vegas only has two, and they're probably going to be too expensive to get. John Carlson's really interesting because he's got the X factor. Um, I think he might be dropping off, though, so that is a bit concerning. Taking a look at the Winnipeg Jets. Couple interesting guys. Obviously, Klingberg, the offensive defenseman, don't want him. And now we are back to the start. So we are going to jump to the find, uh, the trade finder, I should say. Do the find trade. Um, and, and just see what the teams are asking for, for for the players that I was interested in. So we're going to start with Boston at the top because I think I was the most interested in Brandon Carlo. I think, honestly, he, he just looks like a fantastic player to go after. His passing is fine. His offensive awareness isn't the best, so I don't expect him to put up a ton of points. Um, but he's got such a great physical category and defensive category. And it looks like he sims well enough. And you guys can see here, there's a couple player trades that Boston's interested in, and I'm kind of interested in as well. Um, then they also seem to want our next year's third. So that could be a move that we end up doing. One of these trades, they look pretty interesting. Um, to start here, we wanted to start looking into that one, but the Red Wings called us about Kuzmenko, even though I accidentally set a seller, and I do not want to get rid of Kuzmenko. Um, but we are going to go to Calgary now because we know what Boston wants. So we're going to jump ahead and see what they want for Uyghur. And they want Matty Beneers one for one. It's just not going to happen. Uh, I'm looking through here at the other players that we could potentially get. Brett Pesci, like I said, only fits the third defensive pairing. Not a guy we're going to go after. I was going to call on Philip Ronick here. Um, he looks really good. Six years at five and a half million is a really long, solid deal for an 86 overall. Uh, but they seem to want a little bit more than Boston does for Carlo. Obviously, the longer-term deal, a uh, little bit better player, li offers a little bit more offensively. So I can understand why why Detroit would be thinking they can get more out of him. Um, as you can, guys can see, we're still trying to figure out where we're going. And we're going to the New Jersey Devils next to maybe see if we can get one of their medium elite youngsters. John Marino uh, thought about him, but he's only a two-way defenseman. But we're going to see if we can get Kostitsin. We're not going to be able to get Kostitsin, and we're probably not going to be able to get Nemec either. Uh, Knizov is drawing some interest from across the league, and like I said, at 2.275, for the kind of guy he is, I'm not going to give him a raise, and I don't think he's going to ask for a, a pay cut. <laughs> so I, I think that um, 
he's going to be a guy that I'm fine with moving on from because if we are going to make a move for a defenseman at the deadline, uh, we are going to have to move somebody out or scratch somebody, right? We either scratch Knizov or Coglin. I think it's going to be Knizov because we're bringing in another defensive defenseman, hopefully. Um, we would scratch Knizov, so I'm okay with sending him back the other way in some kind of of trade here for uh, a defensive defenseman. As you guys can see, it is 10:30. I'm just kind of scrolling through here quickly to see, you know, what else could we end up getting. Pareko was another interesting one. I might have should have looked into that one a bit more, um, just simply because the X factors do help you out on chemistry. So even if he doesn't fit the the scheme, he can still get you pluses. Um, for John Carlson, they just kind of want way too much. It's no longer prime Carlson, guys. I'm sorry. I'm not giving you my medium elite goaltender and my awesome defensive defenseman in Marcus Patterson. Uh, Dmitry Orlov is a two-way defender, but a bit more offensive. So we're going to go back to Boston because we had the most, most, uh, uh, we saw eye to eye the most with Boston as far as things that I'm willing to give up and things that they want. Um, we see eye to eye here. Zaka is an interesting one. I don't really want to give up Zaka. Um, at 3.57 as an alternate captain, an 83 overall, really a staple of the third line. He's just, just so well-rounded, right? He's not going to blow you away with anything. He can also, in a pinch, jump up to the second line. But I am going to jump back here because they did want some other players, some other trades. So let's take a look, remind ourselves what exactly they wanted for Carlo. Um, as you guys can see, we have an hour to get this deal done. Paterka McMichael, Knizov, Addison McMichael, Dickinson, Zaka a third, and we already saw that one, but Addison McMichael and Dickinson is a very, very interesting trade here. Um, I, I'm willing to throw in Dickinson for sure because he's our 13th forward. I love him, but, uh, you know, it's not worth it. And, of course, they call me in the middle of this trade, meaning I have to now go propose the trade again. Seattle is trying to sabotage us, and I know that's a fact. I know for a fact Seattle's trying to sabotage us because we are rivals as expansion teams. But Knizov is probably going to be the first guy I throw in there. So that's the spot that Carlo is going to take. One of the six defensemen had to be moved out. Uh, I'm going to give up a next year, this year's third. As well as adding in uh, a center in Dickinson. Will it go through? It's close. I didn't think so. It's just not even close enough is what they're saying. I'm going to take this year's third off the block. Uh, skaters matching the block. I'm not really sure who else I want to give up that they want. Uh, looking here, you know, you can see Addison, Paterka. Um, those guys had a bit more value. And I think right now I'm kind of looking at McMichael. He's fine. He's 24. He's got a little bit more value. But I think getting Brandon Carlo um, in, also adding in Rodrigue, who we looked to trade at the beginning of the season, was another one. The trade was rejected. So we are going to have to throw a bit more in. Uh, but, but McMichael is fine. Dickinson, I think is a veteran on that, uh, fourth line would be fine to step in. Uh, this year's third is too far off, but I know it's really close. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw in next year's fourth and we are going to get Brandon Carlo and we have gotten ourselves a new first pairing right-handed defensive defenseman with only 20 minutes to spare. And we are ready to get this, uh, season over with. And I think we look pretty good because we didn't really give up many futures. Yes, McMichael could have jumped. A third and a fourth is is fine and whatnot. But, uh, you know, taking a look here just to remind ourselves, Knizov, McMichael, uh, a third, Rodrigue, and a fourth for Carlo. I mean, I feel like it's a pretty realistic deal, too, if you think about it. Um, that feels like a solid deal. You know, you got a future goalie. You got a young NHLer. You've got uh, two, actually two young NHLers. And then I had to laugh at this. Uh, the fact that they placed Rodrigue on waivers so I could have claimed him back. I'm not going to cheese it that hard, guys. That's pretty funny. Um, but they did end up uh, ruining my lines here. <laughs> um, Victor Olofsson's now on the second line and whatnot. So we do have to shift things around. Benson's going to go to center because we got a plus three, actually, with Matthews on the left wing and Yamamoto on the right wing. And that allows me to keep the Kuzmenko veneers uh Sorelli line together, which we saw was like the best plus line I think I've ever seen in Shell. Um, but then we just keep the lines as is. We could get a plus one with Marchman up there. I don't think it's worth it because Victor Olison, like I said, has been putting up plenty of points. And I think Dickinson, Marchman, Paterka, you can, can see that if we moved somebody else off that line, we could get a plus one. But I really think Yamamoto is good enough to stay on that first line because it 
you, you know what he does? He's still young enough to grow a little bit, and it allows us to, like I said, keep the Kuzmenko line together. Kuzmenko, Benir, Sorelli. And you guys can see here, Carlo now is one for one up there um, where Pedersen was. And now Pedersen, I don't really feel like his play deserves to be dropped. And I think what I want to do is give an offensive defenseman to that bottom six. So I'll put Addison there with Coglin, Pedersen with Bean, uh, and then Gerard and Carlo play together. But Pedersen has just been too good for me to re realistically drop him. I know Addison's also a massive plus, but I think having the... Uh, the, uh, the offensive defenseman will help guys like Safranov and will help guys uh, like Paterka and Dickinson and Zaka and Olofsson. I think having Addison down there will help. You know, I'm really struggling here when I was recording this to decide what to do. I end up putting uh, Pedersen on the second line with Bean, don't worry. Uh, and Addison drops to the bottom with uh, Coglin. But we are ready to get the end of the season sim underway. Now that the trade line is all set, uh, let's jump up to the end of the month here because there's four games left. We'll see really where we stand. Paterka has accepted that contract extension. Patterson accepted it as well. Brooke and Lennox as well. So Paterka accept the two-year 1.4. Uh, Marcus Patterson the three-year 4.75. And boom, four straight wins before a loss to the Rangers. And we pick it right back up with a Brandon Carlo revenge game where we win three straight wins. So that is seven uh, in one, eight in one, nine in one, ten in one since the deadline. Uh, 11 and one since the deadline, 12 and one, 12 and two in the month after the deadline. In the month of March, we went 12 and two, and we are now an elite team. 97 points, three points behind the Flames, two points behind the Canucks. Yes, the other teams have games in hand, but now Matthews is over a point per game. So Carlo has allowed Girard to get that offense going on the top line, and so does Yamamoto help out Austin Matthews on that top line. And same thing with Zachary Benson. There's not really much of a reason to worry about positioning because we have clinched the playoffs. So the first time in Hammerhead's history, season three, oh, by the way, 14 and two since the deadline and we got Brandon Carlo. Uh, we now play the Carolina Hurricanes, which we end up beating. So 15 and two since the deadline. We now have one more game against the Sharks. And taking a look here, guys, if we win it, we can end up getting the number one seed in the Pacific if we win it and things fall our way. Um, we do need to beat them, and we end up taking a loss, so 15-3. and three to The Sharks were kind of fighting for seeding. Not really, though. Uh, maybe so, but uh, we would not have probably caught up to the Canucks anyway, but we would have had home ice advantage against the Flames had we won that game. Um, because everything else is pretty much even between us and the Flames. We did have the tiebreaker on them, which we will see here in just a second. But every team is now done for the season. And like I said, guys, ooh, sorry about punching my mic. Um, I am going to put the playoffs in their own video for just season three. If you guys like that, let me know. If you don't like that, also let me know. Uh, and I can include it at the end of this video, right? We're already sitting here at 42 and a half minutes long, um, in this season, and I don't want to add another half an hour for the playoffs uh, for you guys uh, to, to try and get all the way down to the end. So I figured if we make the playoffs, I will show you. But 103 points in season three after two seasons where we tanked. We're now a top team so close to being a number one team in the Pacific and the West. But you guys can see goals four per game are really, really good. 3.34, best in the Pacific. 2.72 against is third best in the Pacific. And as we know, guys, we are in a very, very gritty defensive division. And for us to be as good offensively and still be elite defensively, our power play percentage was still not good, but it was actually one of the better ones in our division. And then our penalty kill was third, and we came into, a, uh, into the playoffs on a blistering pace. Now, taking a look at the players this season, Austin Matthews did finish as a plus, hit 40 goals, 85 points, but Matty Beniers, Kuzmenko, Sorelli, all basically 70-point players. Yamamoto on the top line of 27 goals, 64 points. Zachary Benson with 62 in his rookie season. He also finishes a plus 10, so I cannot wait to see what he's going to do in the future. Samuel Girard with 53. Uh, Olofsson with 48 on the third line. I'll take that. You know, uh, the top six guys are up there. And then you got Olafson, our, our our next best, our seventh forward, which I will take for what we signed him for. 23 goals on him as well. Safranov with 36 points. Seems to have really found his footing in the NHL. Took 200 shots. So when he gets to the top line, he is a shooter. Pavel Zaka with 33 points was fine. Pedersen plus 41. That's elite. Jake Bean 
Solid season for him. Ended up improving the plus minus down the stretch as well. Playing with Pedersen. Uh, Kalen Addison had a great season as well. Paterka, Marchment. Carlo, we'll see how he did as the hammerhead. And he had four points, but a plus 16 in 18 games. So he was certainly crucial to the turnaround. We had the 15 and 2, 15 and 3 stretch we had after the deadline, 15 and 3 after the deadline. He was a huge help to that. Giveaway to takeaway ratio is fine for a defensive defenseman. Coglin had a solid season, and of course, we got Brandon Carlo for two more years. Uh, Dickinson was four points and a plus four, so he helped out Paterka and Marchman on the fourth line, and I think we just have to accept that Dickinson, Paterka may be our fourth line of the future, and Uko Pekalukin in a solid enough season. 40 wins, six shutouts, a 912 and a 272, and an in behind him also had a great season, 236 and a 915. So I'm very, very happy uh, with our goaltending. I can't really complain. Goaltending does not matter all that much um, in, the, in, in, in the sim anyway. Uh, but Brad Marchand led the NHL in points, followed by Ovechkin, Nathan McKinnon, Goudreau, Victor Hedman at 91 and 90, and Dreisaitl and Pasternak are the only other two players to hit 90 points. So not a lot of, not a lot of points this season. A lot of defense being played. But Alexander Ovechkin... Um, and now has 929 um, goals in his career. He has exceeded by 35 uh, goals uh, the record set by Wayne Gretzky. So he is at, he, he might actually get 1,000 goals in his career. He's got 929. He's showing no signs of slowing down. He signs no signs of retiring either. But he's got 929. And obviously, Victor Hedman is going to win the Norris. 91 points, a plus 40, 17 goals. That, that's the most insane season I've ever seen from a defenseman, especially not an offensive defenseman, just a regular defenseman here. As you guys can see, if we scroll down just a bit, you know, we've got we've got our own guy up there towards the top. we got Samuel Girard. He finishes a plus three. He did take a step back in points, 69 last season, but he improved his plus minus, and he got Austin Matthews, and he's playing with those youngsters on the first line for a little while. Zachary Benson will hopefully jump a ton. Safranov will hopefully jump as well. Um... But you guys can see, we've used him a little bit more every season, and I think he's been phenomenal. He's been the staple of this franchise. And we take a look at the goaltending. We know Lukanen's not going to win anything, but Spencer Knight, oh my word. UC Saros as well at the 923. But you can see, Uko Pekka Lukanen's 912 is about league average, right? It's pretty, uh, you know, consistently average. But Spencer Knight with a 223 goal against average and a 923. I mean, that's that's insane. You can see Lukanen's 272 is again pretty average uh, in the middle part of the league, you know, the middle 15, I'd say. Not top 10, not bottom 10, but somewhere in the middle. Um, so uh, I'm fine with that. I'm not too worried about that. And then our AHL team, Strombolopoulos, coaches the team to the top seed yet again. Best in the conference as well. 105 points, 50 wins. Things are looking good. So let's take a look and see if anybody has grown this season. Obviously, uh, Matthew's no longer growing because of uh, natural growth. He got one more face-off in there, but the rest from here on out is statistical growth. Same thing for, for Samuel Girard. Anthony Sorelli, uh, statistical growth is keeping him a, a top player. Matty Beniers, uh, not a ton of uh, natural growth, which is a bit concerning, but I think he should jump in the offseason. Brandon Carlo didn't grow. Uko Pekalukanen had some natural growth with his glove, which is necessary because his glove is his worst aspect. Kyler Yamamoto seeing both statistical and natural growth. Um, so you can see that he is going to be a fantastic player. I think he's fine to play on the first line next year. Honestly, guys, I think a first line of uh, Matthews, Benson, and uh, uh, and Yamamoto would be great with the Kuzmenko, Sorelli, Beniers line. Um, Marchment was okay with some statistical growth. Paterka grew a little bit statistically, which I was surprised about. Uh, but nobody else really grew. Zachary Benson and Safranov... Actually, Benson, you see some natural growth there in the puck skills to get him in the mid-80s, 86s, right? Instead of 84s, that's a big, big jump, and we'll see what happens in the offseason. His offensive awareness is already a 91, and this is where I was like, okay, his speed went up again to 92. The kid can fly. Um, but one of the things I was looking at was the offensive awareness, and you can see while Safranov's grew, he's still five points behind Benson, which is probably why Benson was able to hang on the first line like he did um, but Safranov looks like he's growing just fine. I'm not worried about him at all. Norlinder didn't grow. And then in the AHL or in the system, Lincoln Van Riemsdyk, 
uh, is growing. Crane, I'm not worried about him. He's a medium AHL top sixer. Maybe he'll be a good AHL player for us. Berkeley Catton grew as well. Uh, some uh, natural growth all over the place here. So you love to see things like that. A medium seventh defenseman. Um, for a second, I got confused because he's got the uh, X factors, but that's just the visual glitch. Those are Berkeley Catton's X factors. And you can see everybody's going to have them from here on out. Uh, Tristan Varlamov, Timofey Varlamov, excuse me. I keep calling him Tristan. Timofey Varlamov uh, had some nice natural growth as well. And then Brust Brustevich didn't grow the way I thought he would. Maybe he'll jump. Um, and Kibiharu didn't have a lot of in-season growth either. So that's a little bit concerning, but I'm not, not pushing the panic button on him yet. I'm still going to give him a year or two to jump. But that is all the progression here, guys. And as you know, we will be taking on the Calgary Flames in round number one of the playoffs. So that'll have to wait for the next one, guys. So make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see some more. And I will see you guys in the playoffs. It's a free for all, free for all.